So I was saying that as we stud, study life, all the life that we find out there is based on carbon, all life on Earth. Now, now life on Earth can have, you know, can use things other than carbon. For example, certain diatoms can build silicon shells, but the actual genetic code of the diatoms is still carbon-based. And uh, they're all based on the same basic uh, building blocks. And so that becomes very, very essential. Even things like viruses, which don't have DNA, they're still based on these same sort of building blocks. And um, so uh, uh, that's, that's basically how, how life works. And DNA replicates. Again, this is how viruses get you, is viruses can come in here and take over this process and then reproduce themselves. Okay, so they can start reproducing themselves in here instead of your own genetic code. And if they don't reproduce, they can actually encode their, their genetic code in you. So you get a virus and you get better. Well, you don't always get better because sometimes the virus actually changes your DNA. Uh, in fact, a large portion of human DNA is viral DNA. Well, a couple of scientists, Miller and Uri, did an experiment a number of decades ago seeing, you know, can you make amino acids? So what they did was they replicated the original atmosphere of Earth, which was, you know, had some nitrogen in it, some water vapor, carbon dioxide, some hydrogen maybe. Uh, oxygen wasn't there. It needed life to make oxygen. And so uh, they, they shocked it, you know, with some elect electricity, uh, basically simulate what lightning would do. And after they ran this for a while, it started making a mixture of amino acids. Uh, and so they call that a primordial soup. Now, the idea is these amino acids could possibly come together and then form life. Now, how that happens, that's, I don't know, that's beyond the level of this course. Uh, Nine biologists really understand how that works. We've never made life in the laboratory. We've modified life in the laboratory, but we've never created life out of nothing. And so uh, that's, that's, uh, 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 th this idea of, of a primordial soup just simply says these amino acids could be produced naturally. And we know that the, uh, uh, the primordial soup does, did it, you know, possibly exist. We know that these amino acids are produced in, in, the, in the proplids and in the comets. And so, you know, and it could be that, that they were delivered to Earth that way instead of being originated on Earth. Uh, but uh, biologists still don't really understand how life came about. So this is a big question. You know, some say, well, if you get the right ingredients, you wait long enough, then eventually they'll start replicating and making life. And others say, no, it's very difficult to make it do that. And so in that case, that life originating would be very, very rare. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, issues here. We did, are pretty sure, though, we need water. Uh, water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, okay? Hydrogen, one of the most common things in the universe. In stars, hydrogen fuses to helium. Helium fuses to carbon. If a carbon grabs an extra helium, it becomes an oxygen. And so oxygen is fairly common as well, and uh, so that's, that's good. The other thing is water is liquid at just the right temperature. If it's too hot, carbon chemistry doesn't work real well. You know, that's why, you know, a high temperature can kill you. It, it messes up the, your, your amino acids, okay? And, uh, in fact, that's how your body tries to kill an infection is it raises the temperature to start messing up with, messing up things up and interfering with uh, viruses or things replicating because uh, they, they, don't, they don't do as well at a high temperature. You don't either. And so the question is, you know, do, does it kill the, the infection or kill you first? Uh, so that's, that's what temperature does. Uh, if it's too cold, then the reactions don't work so well. So if you get too cold, then you quit having the chemical reactions. That's hypothermia, uh, and then you die. And so you got to be the right temperature. Water turns out, turns out to be liquid at just the right temperature for organic molecules or, or carbon-based molecules. Uh, water's also polar, meaning that it's got plus and minus sides to it. So it's a very good solvent. It's able to move other molecules around very easily. So other things don't do that. So that makes water a perfect thing. So that's why when we look at 
another star, we define something called the habitable zone, or sometimes called the Goldilocks zone, uh, um, as the distance at which water can be liquid. If you're too close to the star, it's too hot. If you're too far away, it's too cold. If you're at just the right distance, water could be liquid on a planet. And so that would be the right place to look for life. Now, this is what we call the traditional habitable zone. It is possible that you could be outside the habitable zone and weird conditions could happen. For example, you could be too close to a star, but you might have clouds that block uh, some of the sunlight and keep the planet just barely cool enough, or it might be cooler underground. You might be outside the habitable zone, but there might be a, like a massive greenhouse effect that keeps you going, uh, that keeps you warm. Or uh, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, uh, tidal interaction with the Jupiter, even though it's way outside the habitable zone, tidal interaction with the Jupiter, stretch it and squeeze it and heat it up so that it, it, it actually has liquid water on it. Uh, so, so it is possible here to be outside the habitable zone and still have liquid water, but this is just the, the basic idea. And so, uh, if you look at the solar system, now, actually how you define the habitable or habitability zone is a little bit different because some people define it a little narrower, some people define it a little bit wider. Obviously, Earth is in the habitable zone. They argue whether Earth is in the middle of the habitable zone or near the outside of the habitable zone or near the inside of the habitable zone. And so, uh, they actually, you know, modern feeling is... Earth is probably near the inner edge of the habitable zone, and then Mars is just outside, and Venus is well. Uh, so that's the idea, but for the different size stars, for cooler stars, remember lower mass stars are going to be cooler stars like red dwarfs, you have to be very close to being in the habitable zone. For uh, uh, stars that are hotter, you can be farther away and still be in the habitable zone. And so uh, the size of the star, one of the problems you run into, though, is if the star is too small, like a K or an M star, you, the habitable zone is so close to the star that tidal interaction to the star keep one side of the planet always facing the star, what we call synchronous rotation. Um, there's huge debate over whether the planet in synchronous ro rotation really should even count as being habitable. It might be in a habitable zone, that is, the right distance and liquid water, but if one side is always facing the star, it's too hot. If the other side's always facing away, it's too cold on that side. And so, you know, you know, on Earth, you know, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic are facing away from the sun for several months of the year, and look how cold they are. Okay, what would happen if they were facing away from the sun forever? Okay, then you're not going to have life. Okay. And so, um, you know, and, and the in-between zone, between the two, uh, it's going to be so stormy, it might not be suitable for life. And so they have a huge argument over whether a, a synchronous rotation planet really is even habitable. Uh, we're not sure. And again, even with a star uh, that has a habitable zone, over time, the habitable zone changes, even for the sun. You know, when the sun was much younger, it was a different brightness, and it's possible the habitable zone was wider. At the, at the current age, the habitable zone includes Earth, but in the future, the habitable zone might actually, in a billion years, be outside of Earth's orbit, so Earth would not be habitable anymore. We already talked about that as to how stars die, that, that in the distant future, Earth will not be habitable. So that's, that's another thing to consider. But you could be a habitable planet outside the habitable zone. I talked about the moon Europa, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, it's tug, caught in a tidal war, tidal tug of war uh, between uh, Jupiter's other big moons and Jupiter itself. And so it stretches, it stretches and squeezes it, and that warms the interior. And so the surface is coated in ice because it's too far from the sun to be warm. But underneath the ice, we have reason to believe there's a large ocean of salt water. Uh, uh, so that's, and it, and it may even have the right ingredients for life. Uh, Enceladus, this is a moon of Saturn. 
um, way, way too far for me to have ozone, but there's there's indications it's got geysers of liquid of water spewing up uh, from it, and so there there is potentially a large ocean or or or, or reservoir of liquid water under the surface, heated partly by tidal interactions and partly by uh, radioactive decay, and also kept cool by sort of a natural antifreeze uh, ammonia salts. Uh, so again, you know, th there are other possibilities out here, maybe life, not as we know it, but life that we could recognize as life. Speaking of life, not as we know it, uh, there are some life forms even on Earth that are darn weird. Uh, as I said, you get too hot, life doesn't work very well. But there are, there have been, uh, uh, there have been life forms that have been discovered uh, in living bacteria living in uh, hot springs in volcanic uh, 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 parks. You know, places like Yellowstone National Park, where you have the geysers and the hot springs. It's way too hot for life, they thought, but they did find a few bacteria that live in these superheated environments. Uh, also, it turns out that there's a, a bacteria that's been discovered growing on fuel rods in nuclear reactors. Uh, so radiation that's thought that would kill anything except this particular kind of bacteria. And so there are a few extremophiles. So these are, th are organisms that will live in these extreme environments. Uh, so even though you might have a planet that has extreme environment, it is remotely possible that life could live there. And so, but it's not, it's a question whether life could evolve or originate on a, an extreme environment or would life simply adapt to the extreme environment.